So welcome. Um, this is my talk about functional reactive programming in um, web-based front-end applications. So here's a high-level list of the topics that I'll be covering. Uh, first, a description of what functional reactive programming is, um, and then how I have used it and how some other people are using it in web app front ends and well, user interfaces in general. Um, why? What I see as the advantages of it. Then I will go through some of the more noteworthy parts of a um, demo application that I've written that shows the pattern cleanly. Um, then I'll go over some tips that I've learned in using this in uh, real life. This is a pattern that I first worked on or first used while I was working on the DEFT project uh, a few months ago, a year ago. Um, and then finally, since, this F since using functional reactive programming this way is relatively new, there are some unanswered design questions that um, people still need to work out, and so I'll go over those a little bit at the end. So what is FRP? So this is um, my definition of it, kind of. So programming with functionally composed values that automatically react to changes in the values of their dependencies. So for an example of that, so let's say we define some variable that's called now, and it's a FRP property that we get from some current time function. And so what now is, is it's not just the current time when this line executes, it represents the current time whenever you access it, the current time at any time. And so then from that, you can create another property that represents 24 hours into the future at any given time. And so this is how you would do that. You would um, map over the now property with this function that adds um, 24 hours worth of milliseconds to it, and that gives you a tomorrow property. And then again, we can compose a new property called message from the tomorrow property by mapping over it and interpolating a string. So any questions on that? Um, I mean, so this is pseudocode, but the library I use does refer to that data type as property. Different different FRP libraries do have different terminology, unfortunately, but that's uh, in the one I use. That's what it's called. So when when does FRP? Sorry. When is now Yeah. So whenever we ask for it? Well, so depending on the some a lot of FRP libraries, including the one I use, don't have a way to synchronously ask for the value. All you can do is compose new new properties from it and then ultimately um, put an event listener on the one where you need to interact with non FRP code. So eventually you so you could after this you could call like message dot on value and then every millisecond you'd get a new message. Um, that's the string with the right number in it. So uh, there's two major data types in the FRP library that I was using. Um, first is property, which is what I was just showing you, and that basically represents a value that can change over time, and it has a rich functional API for creating new properties from that one. So map, like I just showed you, flat map, merge, um, concatenation, uh, sampling one property based on when another one changes, things like that. Um, who here is familiar with flat map in general? Okay. So flat map, like with a list, is basically just map and then flatten. Well, with a, a um, with a property or a, of an FRP stream, which is the next data type we'll go over, flat map is if you have your mapping function returns another property or another stream, then that will combine them. And so that way you can have um, that allows you to do asynchronous operations like AJAX that return streams themselves. You can do those within the processing of a stream and then combine that into the overall stream. Um, and then finally, there's also a traditional like event listener API, as I just mentioned, on value, also on error and on end. Um, and those allow you to basically, sooner or later, you have to do something outside of the FRP, outside of FRP land, and that's how you interact with that. Value code when the uh, property decides to emit something? Yeah, the callback you pass into one value gets called every time it 
changes to the property and decide what to call it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so then there's also streams, which are almost the same exact thing as properties. The only difference is that they have no concept of a current value. So with the properties, um, so let's say, going back to our example here, let's say you subscribe to now in the middle of a clock tick. So it ticked, um, you know, 500 nanoseconds ago. You will immediately get the current time, and then in the next 500 nanoseconds, you'd get it when it clicks again. Um, so that's the concept of a current value that stream that properties have. You can't synchronously call like get value, but you can subscribe, and if it already has a value at that point, you'll immediately get that in your subscriber. Um, streams, on the other hand, do not have a concept of a current value, and so they're more useful th for things like event listeners. So you can have like a stream of mouse click events. It doesn't make any sense to keep track of what the previous mouse click event was in most cases. So there's no current value um, with streams. The API for them other than that is exactly the same though. Um, and as I mentioned, this is the words and how this is broken up varies a little bit depending on which FRP library you're using. So this is um, kefir.js is the one that I'm using. That's what this comes from. There's also rx.js, bacon.js, um, as well as other ones for different languages besides JavaScript. And the terminology and distinction between these two types varies a little bit in different libraries. Some of them just call it observable and they only have one. What's so the name of the library you use? Kefir, K-E-F-I-R. And I'll have, I have a link to it at the very, very end. Um, question. So the semantic distinction between property and stream, property implies like a scalar value, that, while stream <coughs> implies a list. Well, not exactly. I mean, stream implies like event stream, and property implies a value that changes over time. But in one case you get list of values, in the other case you get list of values. What's, what's the difference? Right. That's why. That's why ultimately the only difference is how it handles any concept of a current value. So if you subscribe to a property, you'll immediately get, it'll immediately fire as if a new value had just arrived, but it hasn't just arrived, it was already there, but it kept track of that and fired it to you. Okay. Whereas with a stream, if, so let's say I have a stream of mouse clicks and the user clicked the mouse uh, a second ago and you subscribe to that stream, you won't get that previous mouse click. Okay. And in most cases, you wouldn't want to. So it's from the time you subscribe onward while property catches it from? Yeah, from property will give you one back and then onward. Okay, so um, that's FRP in general. So now we're going to look at how you can use it to build um, the user interface part of a web application. So at a very high level, this is basically how it flows. Um, your external inputs are represented as streams, and then from those you can derive a single unified application state. So you have a single object with sub-objects that represents your entire state, anything that can change in your front end application, the value of every text box, all of your data that you're caching, all that stuff is in one big state object. And that object is derived from your external inputs. And then from that, you derive your user interface, which is represented using virtual DOM or something similar. And we'll go over what that means a little later. Um, so as it notes at the bottom here, typically your inputs are streams and your state and your UI are, proper, are properties. So what this means is, um, for one thing, it's a unidirectional data flow. So every change to your UI happens because of a change to the state, which happens because of some external input. Um, you don't have state stored within your UI code, and you don't have your UI code directly manipulating the state. Um, you have your con state is consolidated. So again, in, in a lot of older apps I've worked on that didn't use this pattern, often each UI component would store a little bit of state, and there'd sometimes be redundancy and things getting out of sync a lot. Um, so this avoids that. And finally, your, your UI is defined as a pure transform from your state. So your UI is essentially just a function that takes your state object and outputs a representation of the DOM from that. Um, so at the bottom here, don't update the UI, update the state, and the UI will follow. Here's 
similar to that first diagram but with more detail. So if we start with user interaction. So the user clicks a button, the user's little smiley face, they click a button. Now depending on what that button is um, supposed to do, if all that button does is change something in the front end, then that's going to fire what I call an action. And an action is simply a function that takes uh, one instance of the state and returns a new instance of the state. So basically your actions are how the state gets mutated. They're the only way it gets mutated as a matter of fact. Um, Alternatively, if you need some AJAX or something to happen as a result of that user interaction, then what gets fired off is what I call an async action. And an async action is a function that returns a FRP stream of actions. And so because streams can handle asynchronicity, then that takes care of that. That basically abstracts over the fact that you're doing AJAX, and so you get that stream of actions, and then you can combine that with the actions that come directly from user interactions. And those all go into what's labeled as the state engine here, which is basically um, a piece of code that churns over the current application state, applying each action to it one at a time to make the new state, and so on, um, continually updating the state with any actions that come in. And then from that, the user interface gets derived from the state. Any questions before we move on? centralized in one place, does that mean that state is actually being moved or copied all the time, or is it only parts of it are being copied? So, yeah, you do create new instances of it for each action, but you use a library that makes that not suck, um, immutable.js in my case. Um, and so what that is, is it's basically a library that um, makes asymptotically efficient immutable data structures so that when you need to make a new one that's like an old one plus some change. It doesn't have to copy the entire thing. It, um, they're internally represented as trees so that it can share parts of the tree when it creates new objects. Okay. So you're gonna go <coughs> yeah, I actually show the whole code of it. It's like 12 lines. Okay. <coughs> um, so yeah, this is just to pretty much to reiterate what I just described. So actions are simple, pure functions that transform the state. They are the only thing that transforms the state. So whenever your state gets screwed up, you know that that's where it happened. Um, that makes that easy to track down. So there was, though, the error going back from application state. Uh, yeah, so that's only because the state engine needs to, obviously, to call an action on the current state. It needs to have the current state. Mm -hmm. So that's all that, that error represents. <coughs> Um, so your user interactions, your event handlers in the UI are pretty much all they do is create actions and async actions and send them down the pipeline. Um, async actions are for AJAX and anything else, calling OBF um, communication functions, that sort of thing. Um, and the results of those are represented as an FRP stream of more actions. And then the state engine takes all those actions and um, applies them to the state to make new state, which the UI gets rendered from. So what about performance? So <coughs> naively, we're saying that we're basically re-rendering the entire UI every time anything changes, and that, that obviously doesn't work well in practice. So what th some recent libraries have come up with is a concept called virtual DOM. So the problem with the DOM API, well, one of the problems with the DOM API, of course, is that the the objects you create are heavy, heavyweight. They represent real UI components on the screen. Um, so whenever you change anything in them, there's all, all sorts of painting and reference counting and other operations that happen, have to happen under the covers. Um, and so you don't want to be just recreating all of them all the time. Um, so libraries like Facebook's React.js have created a virtual DOM concept where you have these very lightweight classes that basically just represent DOM nodes in the form of this is what type of element it is, this is its attributes, and this is its children. And so that's pretty cheap to recreate frequently. And then it's got a diff algorithm, diffing algorithm, that takes those virtual DOM nodes and checks to see how they differ from the actual DOM state and applies the minimal set of changes to the DOM. Now that, of course, isn't free, but it's reasonably performant. 
um, certainly performant enough in most cases. So here's the list of specific technologies that I'm using. I think I've mentioned all these at this point. So Kefir is the FRP library. Immutable is what I'm using for my data structures. And React is what I'm using for the UI. So FRP was uh, first named and created in 1997. And it was originally used for animations. Um, then using it for UIs, particularly web UIs like this, was popularized, um, as far as I know, by Elm, and possibly by others as well. Um, and that's happened pretty recently. Within the last couple of years, that's been picking up steam. And then this exact way of doing it, with these three libraries and some of the terminology I'm using, like async action, that's uh, some stuff that I came up with. Um, so if you try to use someone else's FRP implementation, just know that some of the terms won't match up one to one. So what are the benefits of this? So it works well with functional programming. It's um, the best way that I've seen to do UIs in functional code. Um, and so you get all the typical advantages of functional programming if you work with this. Um, immutability, pure functions, declarative programming. Um, does everybody know what I mean by each of those? And then um, the other thing I really like about it is that the FRP streams and properties give a unified abstraction for a number of different things <laughs> that traditionally we've used separate libraries for. Things like browser events, AJAX, and most notably your data store management. So a lot of other, um, a lot of other patterns for using React have dedicated special purpose libraries for managing your data. And with this pattern, that's just not necessary because it's, uh, it's just another stream. So in terms of differences between FRP and some other stuff that people have worked with, so who here has used some of the stuff on the left? Okay. And who here has used some of the stuff on the right? Okay. So the things on the left are more traditional imperative, object-oriented style um, UI <coughs> technologies. And they often favor um, statefulness, mutable statefulness, and two-way data binding. And FRP is the opposite. It doesn't do two-way data binding deliberately. It, you know that when something changes, it only changed because um, an action changed it. Um, the focus on immutability, so you don't have mutable state in your UI components or really anywhere else. Um, and finally, of course, just the, the way the code is structured, you don't really have classes in this. You have, I mean, you've got data structures, certainly, and then functions, but the functions you can define them in classes if it, you prefer to organize things that way, but you don't have to. They're just, um, there's not really any usage of like this, like the this variable, or any mutable state like that. So you can define your functions as top level singletons if you want, um, and I do. Then on the other side, so um, as I just mentioned, React is often used in conjunction with <coughs> one of several data layers that are kind of part of a related family called the Flux family. Um, so how does this differ from that? So for one thing, like I said, it's um, the FRP abstraction can be used not just for your data management, but also for these other layers. So it, it avoids having to pull in a separate special purpose library with its own caveats. Um, also, this pattern strictly avoids putting any state in your UI layer, whereas a lot of other React usages will allow you to put state in your UI and just they, they just kind of have a different view on managing that in relation to the overall state that's stored in flux and reflux. Um, also, so flux and reflux and redux don't, as far as I've seen, discourage you from doing a synchronous access of your state. So for instance, in, um, in OZP, which is one of the ODBF projects, we were using reflux, and in some of our stores, we had like getter methods, like get person. and there were bugs that came about because we would call get person and then at some point in the future the person would change and because we didn't subscribe to that but rather just got it synchronously we didn't know that and so things would get out of sync that way. Um, you're not allowed to do that with this FRP pattern. You have to subscribe and so you have to be notified when things change. Um, all that said, I do kind of see 
the older ways of doing things with React as stepping stones towards FRP, and I suspect that the React community will move more and more towards stuff more like this in the future. <coughs> So now for the demo app. So um, I just made a simple to-do list app, which is kind of the traditional way that you demo stuff like this. Did anybody download this ahead of time by any chance? OK. So I'm going to show it now real quick. So the part I'm showing you is the front end, but I made a small back end for it as well so that we can demonstrate, or so that I can demonstrate um, REST calls. So I'll start on both parts. Of course, starting at the same time is a little slow. So I have a node build system for the front end. Um, and it, I mean, it is, I guess, technically a node server because I'm using Webpack dev server, which automatically reloads your sources when you change them. But it's it's really just a the build system on the front end is node. <coughs> So here it is, and so it's your typical simple to-do list application. You can add to-dos, you can edit them, you can mark them as done, and you can delete them. And I feel I should probably mention the CSS on this I stole from a different to-do list, so <coughs> don't credit me with that. Okay, so in the following slides, we're going <coughs> to go through some of the most interesting parts of the code, and here's some things to notice. So every variable is declared with const. I don't use var or let, um, and that, again, goes back to the immutability. Um, in addition to the variable references themselves being immutable, all of the data is also immutable. So I don't use um, POJOs except in, like, kind of, inline like cases. Um, all the models are used are done through mutable.js. Um, and then instead of loops and mutation and things, I do um, functional programming pipelines using map and filter and find and that sort of thing. Um, also there's no use of new. So does anybody know why new is kind of a pain in the ass when you're doing functional programming? It's not composable. So um, if you're trying to do a map call and you're trying to map, so let's say you have a, um, an FRP stream of, or even a list. Let's say you have a list of POJOs that represent to-dos that you just fetched from the server, and you want to turn them into proper to-do model objects. With, if you don't need to use new, like if your constructor set up so that you don't have to use new, then you just say map to-do. You just pass in the function right as the thing you pass in the map. But if it doesn't work that way, if it requires you to use new, then you have to wrap it in another function and write out the parameter and then say return new to do and pass in the parameter. It's just extra annoying boilerplate. So that's what I mean by it doesn't compose. 
So let's start with the model classes. So here we have two files, model.js and todo.js, and they represent the state of the uh, application. Model is kind of the top level state, and todo <coughs> represents each todo. So um, you can see we're calling immutable.record here, and that is kind of a meta constructor. So what immutable.record returns is a constructor for objects that will have properties as per what you pass into immutable.record. So this basically defines model is a, a class, if you will, that has um, the following properties, error message, editing, edit name, to-dos, and adding name. And here you see the default values for each of those. Um, yeah. And so the way immutable records work is you can't add new properties to them. If you try to add some completely different property besides what's in this list to an instance of the model, it won't work. Additionally, if you try to delete a property from it, it won't actually delete it, it'll just set it back to the default. Um, so you get a reasonable assurance that as long as you're dealing with an object of the right type, that it has the expected properties on it here. Um, and of course it gives you a good space to c comment everything and document what your model is. Um, so yeah, so I just listed out what the model, it's, what the top level model has, and then on the each to-do, which of course to-dos, as you see there is an empty immutable list by default, but in general that's the list of all the to-do objects. And each to-do object has an ID, a name, and a completed, uh, completed flag, that is, boolean flag. So that's the common approach to using immutable record as the container for your domain object. That's my approach. I don't know how common it is. I guess so. <coughs> and it's part of which library? Well, immu immutable is the library, yeah. All right, so here's the state engine, uh, as you had asked to see earlier. So basically, um, this function takes three inputs. It takes the, essentially, the pool of, or the stream of actions, the stream of async actions, and the initial value of the state. Um, and so, the first major part is where we take the stream of actions and we call scan on it. And scan is a Kefir function that takes the current value of the out of its own output as well as each value of its input to create the next value of the output, if that makes sense. <laughs> so let's say, so we've got our stream of actions coming in, right? And we've got an initial state. When the first action comes in, scan passes in the initial state and that action into the closure here. And that closure calls the action on the state. And the output of that is a new state. So now that output state comes in with the next action and gets executed with that action and so on. So each, each output of the scan function gets fed back into <coughs> the input to be combined with the action. Does that make sense? <coughs> and then the second part is where we do the async actions. So for that one, we're using a function called sampled by. So every time an async action comes in, that closure fires with that async action and whatever the current value of the state stream is at that time. And so then we just store those in an object real quick and then we flat map to execute the, um, the async action on that state. And we use flat map there because again, async actions return streams themselves. So each time that executes, a stream comes out and those streams all get combined, which results in the overall executed async actions variable there. And then the line below that is where we plug that back into the action pool. So the actions that come out of the async actions go into the action pool with all the other actions and then get fed into the scan. Yes? Okay, so thank you, Mr. They are standard Kefir. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. Well, I understand map. I understand flat map. So what does scan do? Well, that's what I was trying to explain to Nathaniel, and it's kind of hard to explain. Not, not in this context, but in general. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So let me try to write it out on the whiteboard. Let's say that our stream 
those numbers, one, two, three, four, that come in over time. And let's say that we have, um, so let's just skim equals that. And then we call um, stream dot scan. First parameter is a function. Yes. So let's say we're going to use this to add up all the numbers in the stream. So as our function here, we take, um, we've got our number, and then we've got our accumulator value. And then we just add them together, right? And so that's the function. And then as our initial value, we start with zero. Um, and so this, let's call this sum. Very similar to reduce. Is that it's a bit like reduce, yeah. So basically, for every value in this, it's for every value in stream, some stream will have a value that is the sum of that value and all preceding values. So this initial state of the accumulator. Yes. Of this thing. Um, it tests in there, but yeah. <laughs> so accumulator is the first parameter or second parameter? So in your example, it's the second parameter. Uh, minus eight. Okay, so action is the next item from the stream. Yes, because it's the stream of actions. And normal, so the first step, value of one is initial state, and then subsequently do whatever action call would return. Which should be more states, yeah. So model would be the result of this call. Yep. So this is the use. I'm not sure it's quite reduced, but it's kind of like that. <coughs> I mean, it's not quite reduced because if it was reduced, then the output would be a single sum. But the output is a stream of sums. Okay. Um, any more questions on that? Because that this code, while short, is kind of tricky. So sampled by is, so you've got two streams. Um, let's say you've got a stream of clock ticks, so every single millisecond is up to date, and you've got a stream of mouse clicks, and you do clock ticks that sampled by mouse clicks, and so that's going to create a stream that basically has each has the timestamp of each mouse click. So each time the second stream has a thing in it, the thing from the first stream gets returned. Or in the case of what's this doing, what this is doing, you can pass in an optional function that you use to Combine the values of the two. It's a tuple, essentially. Tuple is combined from, from one stream. Or yeah, but it's not every value from both. It's every value from the two when the second one from fires. The, from the least sequence. From the second one. From the second one. Okay. Yeah. So it's a stream of tuples. It's just, I mean, it's what it returns is dependent on what the function, if any, that you pass in there is. But, yeah, it's... So I was going to ask, since you said it was, there are two streams, and it's, I think, selecting when the second stream has something, does that pick the, the most latest available values in the first stream, necessarily? The, I suspect the first, the first one probably has to be a property, is probably how it is. I'm not certain about that, but that makes sense because you can't really <laughs> sample something that has no current value. Yeah, I, d I do fall back into just calling everything streams, both in my talking and in the code, but some of them, a lot of them are actually properties. Ross, I had a quick question. Um, this uh, the state engine seems pretty generic. Could this be reused across many different applications? Yes, definitely. Okay. 
a lot of it from like an example thing or no? Is it like you just you know, no, I wrote that. List? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But I mean, because it was being able to use across multiple applications, you think that it would be something that it's like this is the example state engine that they would have on Kefir, I guess, right? Or um, so Kefir doesn't actually or is there have anything else? UI oriented. Like yeah. Kefir is just FRP in general. This mm -hmm. using it this way to make UIs is out of the scope of Kefir itself. Okay. Um, but that's not to say that a uh, separate library implementing this stuff couldn't be made. Um, okay. And maybe if I reuse it enough, I'll get around to doing that. I don't know. Cool. Okay, so now for the actions. So again, the actions are the only things that ever actually change the state, and they do so by taking the current state and returning a new state. So in this code snippet here, we've got an action, which is that inner function, and we've got what I call an action constructor, which is simply any function that returns an action. So the action constructor is add to do, and you pass in the to do you're going to add to that. And then it returns a function that adds that to do to the model. And so, so basically at the very top, we just um, we create the actual to do model, and then we get its ID, and then within the action itself, we check to see if there's an existing to do with that same ID, and if that is the case, that's a problem, and so then we set the error message on the model. But if that's not the case, then we go ahead and we create a new list of to-dos called new to-dos, which is the existing list with the new model added to the end of it, and then we set that list on the model. And again, that model.set there, that doesn't actually mutate that instance of the model, it returns a new instance that's the same as the old one, but with that value set. Um, so that's a function I made that unsets error message. So that's just another function that's in the same file that just calls model.set error message null. Um, but I do that in a lot of places, so I separated it out. Because the model dot set returns a new one, wouldn't you want the no error to happen first, or existing to do is going to get the one that has the error still? Or how does that work? Like you said, that the set returns a new instance. It does, and then no error takes that instance and returns another new instance, and that's yeah. what gets returned from this function. Okay. Okay. Semantics. So set implies that it's immutable. Uh, all the model is immutable. All the but you're saying it's not so set is implemented just simply taking another instance of the yep. model and assign it immutably to Yep. Is that a common way to name it? I'm just asking about the name. Mm. Set. I think so. I think in other functional programming things they call it update sometimes. Scout from copy, right? When you copy a case class, but you change them? I don't know. I know in Haskell they have a special syntax for basically doing this, and they call it the um, record update syntax. So set, update, whatever. I know in Immutable there is there is another function called update, and what that does is instead of saying, here's the new value, you pass it a closure that takes the old value, does something to it, and returns the new value. Um, and if I wasn't doing all that ID checking stuff here, I probably would have used that instead but I had to get the existing to-dos and use it multiple places anyway, so I might as well just use set. Functional problem question. Yes. So you pass to-do into the output function, and the, so the inner function has a specific to-do bound to it. Mm -hmm. So why, why, why is designed effectively that the inner function takes a model and seems to add a specific to-do to it? Well, so the inner function and the outer function get to execute it at separate times. The outer function gets executed, as we'll see later when I get to event handlers, it gets executed in a DOM event handler. And then that returns the inner function, which gets passed into the FRP pipeline, and then it goes into the state engine and gets executed there. Because <coughs> by the time it gets to the state engine, the depend it's, its dependencies already have to be satisfied. There's nowhere there to pass in the new to-do, because the state engine doesn't know anything about that. There's no 
Right. Exactly. Right. Is there in general just to set the time? Any time the model changes, there's an action that actually does the changing. Mm-hmm. So what was your question? No, that was, it. That was just a okay. that I think you said that. Yeah, so like things like this are the the only things that change the model. So you might have like a remove to do or mm -hmm. yeah. So now for async actions. So these are uh, what you use when you want to do Ajax and stuff, and they return streams of actions which then make the necessary updates on the state. So whereas we just looked at the add to do action, this is the add to do async action. Um, so what this does, as you can see, it, well, it's, so first of all, it's got the same pattern. That inner function there is the actual async action, and the outer function is an async action constructor. Um, so the inner function, the async action, what it does is it gets the, the name of the of the to-do that we're creating, and it gets that from the model, because we already had it stored there because we had to, to keep the um, text box up to date. And it puts that and a false completed flag into a JSON object that it stringifies, and that's what it uses as the message body. And so then down at the bottom, we call fetch stream, and we fetch um, a URL, which is what API entry point is, and we're posting, and we are sending the message body. and so that fetch stream function is a utility function I wrote that um, does the Ajax and then returns a kefir, I guess it's a property, of the result. And so that property can handle the asynchronicity of it, and then when the result comes back, it goes through that map, so where we say map action to do. So the, um, the response body that comes back from the Ajax gets mapped through the add to do action, which is what we just looked at, and so that's what gets passed into this as to do. And so then the overall effect of all that, we pass that through a thing called handle errors, which takes the errors out of the stream and handles them appropriately. And that's basically what we return. Now, that's not exactly what we return, as you can see, because we've also got this merge business going on. And what that is, is um, immediately when this function gets executed, it returns another action, and that is the clear adding name action. So adding name, as we already saw, is a property on the model where the current value of the text box where you add new to-dos is. And so once we hit enter in that, we want what's in there to get cleared out. So clear adding name is just an action that does that. And we wrap that in a stream using kefir.constant. So that just makes it a very simple stream that has that, or I guess property, that has that one value and then ends. And so now we've got two streams, and we combine them together using kefir.merge, and that results in the overall stream that we return from the async action. Any questions? The, the stream, second part of the stream, the stream of response to stream wrapped in to do return by the asynchronous address call. I'm sorry, could you say that again? So it's a stream, it returns a stream which, which contains the function which wraps the to do which is returned by the asynchronous address call. So the the stream that gets returned from that second line within the merge is a stream of actions. Um, to make that stream of actions, we took a stream of POJOs and mapped them over an action constructor. Apply the action constructor to the result, resulting in an action. Yes. Um, that merge. Uh huh. The I guess the order in which you've added those. Does that make sure that you clear the name before you do the Ajax call? So in this case, the order doesn't matter a whole lot because the second one's always going to be asynchronous. But um, basically, it's just whatever order each one of those streams supplies events in. All of them get merged together. If if more if more than one thing in there has a value immediately when you call merge, I suspect it's the order you define them. But in this case, that's not the case because the second one's asynchronous. So the constant stream, I guess, it already has the action immediately. Yeah. So when this gets all evaluated, then it'll be there. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so like when this executes, it doesn't like wait till the Ajax comes back to clear out the text box. It does it immediately. And even if you switch the order of those two, that would still be the case. There's another function called kefir.concat, I think, where it waits until the first stream ends before it call it, well, before it starts pulling things from the second stream. So that's um, so if we go back to the model, so here the that the last property of the top model adding name, so that is where the value of the text box that the user types in new to dos is is stored, okay. Okay. and so we need to clear that when um, when they hit enter, which okay. is what triggers this. The stream would at some point tell the <coughs> same thing. It will tell the UI to clear this. Okay, now for the UI itself. So, a couple of you said you'd used React. Have you all used it um, in the React.create class style, or have any of you used the stateless functional component style? Okay. So more traditionally in React, you would call, you would write React.create class, and then you would pass in a big JavaScript object that defines methods, much like on a lot of other frameworks, how you define UI classes. Um, more recently, they've come up with an alternative style called stateless functional components, where your entire component is just a function. And so that function is just the renderer of your component. Um, and so that's how, in, a f in this style, you can, use you can do that for pretty much all your components. And so that's what we're looking at here. The component is just a function. It takes a couple properties as its parameters, and it outputs virtual DOM as its return value. And it's a pure function. It has no side effects or anything. Um, it's just straightforward computing that virtual DOM. Um, so I guess most of you haven't seen JSX before since you don't use React, but there it is. That's what the angle bracket stuff in the JavaScript is. And so basically that's syntactic sugar over top of a number of um, function calls. So you, you don't have to write that as JSX. You can actually write some function calls that um, do exactly that. You basically, it's like react.create element or something and then you pass in the name of the element as a string and then the attributes as a object and then the um, the children as a list or something. And so this is just syntactic sugar over top of that to make it um, look a little bit more like HTML. Yes, basically. Um, and so there's a few things going on here. So for one thing, you can see in JSX, you have to say, instead of class, you have to say class name, because class is a reserved word in JavaScript. So you can see we're setting the CSS classes on that li element based on our class name local variable, which is computed up above. And that's computed using a utility library called class names. And in this case, we're basically just saying, if the completed flag is true, then we want a class of completed on the object. And if the editing variable is true, then we want a class of editing on that class name. Um, then we define a few more objects. We define the checkbox for whether it's completed or not. As you can see, we're setting the checked attribute to the completed flag there. Um, so one thing that is definitely a little weird when you first start working with React is that what you define here is the state of these DOM elements until you say otherwise. So if the user clicks the checkbox and you don't have your code set up right to update it, it's not gonna it's not actually gonna check the box. Like when you say it's checked here, it's checked. And you get the event saying that the user clicked it, but if you want it unchecked, you have to tell the DOM, you have to tell the you have to tell React that it's now unchecked. And so that seems annoying and redundant at first, but then it, I became more okay with it when I realized, well I have to I should be keeping this in sync with the state anyway. Like, I, I have to do everything anyway that I would have done to reset that, so it's really not any extra work. Um, additionally, here you can see some event handlers getting bound, so on change equals toggle completed. Um, is everybody here familiar with the bind function on JavaScript functions? All right. Have you all used it mostly just for setting this or also for setting parameters? Okay. You're aware you can use it to set partial parameters? Yeah. 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 So that's a that's a big pattern with functional programming. So in this case, because there's that's good, right? Yes. Yeah. So there's no 
there's no this here. The whole thing is just a function, and toggle completed is just another top level function. So we can't say like this.id in that function. So instead, toggle completed has the ID as its first parameter, and we bind that ahead of time here. Um, <coughs> same deal with some of the others. Yeah? Is the mouse visible? Can you help like explain what you were talking about? Sorry. So I'm talking about right here. So that ID gets passed in as the first parameter to toggle completed, and then the event from the actual handler firing gets passed in after that as the second parameter. Um, and then the only other thing that's particularly interesting in here is down here inside these curly brackets, I'm basically conditionally including this element if editing is true. And one thing to notice with this, with JSX, and this is what um, a lot of people really like about it, is this is all essentially JavaScript. You don't have to do, there's not this weird templating language that's half-baked that prevents you from doing things unless you do a special like pound-pound loop or whatever. Um, it's all JavaScript, so you can do exactly what you need to in JavaScript. When you're defining like a whole list of sub-elements, you can define them up here as a list by mapping over something, and then you just include the whole list. Uh, any questions before we move on? All right, so here's the event handler. So as I was mentioning before, here's, here's toggle completed, and it has two parameters, the ID and the event. Um, so this gets bound by that bind call so that the actual event handler is has the ID already specified and then that gets called with the event. And so basically the the only job that the event handlers have is to demarshal any event handling specific kind of stuff like getting the checked value from evt.target and then creating an action or async action and sending those down the pipeline with send action or send async action. And so as you can see, that's what it's doing here. Up here it's doing some um, demultiplexing of key presses to decide what to do when uh, the user is editing. So those sort of inject actions and async actions into the respective streams. So the action stream that goes into the state engine, send action puts an action into that stream and send async action does the same for the async action stream. So we're all, all these were in the last last one, right? For some of these, like all uh, the yeah, yeah, these are all the same, these are all the event handlers for the previous uh, slide, so okay. yeah. Uh, where do those get created? They are actually singletons defining their own files, but I just have a little function called make pool that makes them. They're, they're global. Yeah, they're, they're basically global, yeah. Defined as a linear, a bunch of little Yeah. Okay, so where it all comes together, main. And this is, aside from imports, this is the entirety of main. Um, so first, so this state here, this is the state engine function that we looked at a while ago. So we're passing in the action pool, the async action pool, and the initial state, which is just a default invocation of model. Then we've got, um, in my index.html, I've defined a div with an ID of UI, so we just retrieve that. And then here we call state.onValue, so this is where the FRP part ends and the React part begins. So for each each time the model changes, we get the new model. Um, we log it to the console for debugging purposes. Obviously in production, you don't really want to do that. And then we call React DOM dot render, and app is the name of um, the top level React component that I have, and we pass in the model to that and tell it to render that to the UI uh, div. So finally, then to kick off the data load, we create a load to do's async action and send that to the async action pool. That's what separates the model and that triggers the state on value and that triggers the re render. Yep. After the Ajax comes back. Any questions? So we've only got a few minutes left, so we'll go through this part pretty quick. Um, so 
the performance is adequate in most cases, but not in all cases, at least not unless you try pretty hard. Um, the apps that I did use this in on Deft, one of them was a node graph where you could drag the nodes around with your mouse, and the dragging, of course, is updating everything on um, every mouse drag event, or not mouse drag, mouse move event, so that got pretty slow. Um, so in the red box here, I have the reasons why it was slow, and in the green box, I have things you can do about it. So basically, even with optimizations from React, computing the VDOM can be a bit of a bottleneck. Um, I mean, if you're running through all your render methods in a deeply nested set of components, um, even just computing those basic JS objects that are pretty cheap on their own is a lot of them. Um, additionally, immutable JS collections, while they are optimized asymptotically, they are still slower um, in small cases than, um, than your native objects, especially um, just retrieving values from them is slower because retrieving values from you know a JavaScript array is just like a memory pointer index, whereas retrieving a value from an immutable JS list is a tree descent. Um, so those can add up as well. Functional pipelines, so using map and filter and whatnot, those are a little slower than using for loops. And so overall, if you're doing state changes very rapidly, it can it can be noticeably slow. If you're doing like like that's the only time I've seen it be a problem. Like if you just like click a button, it's fast enough. But if you're doing things like very rapidly, then it can be a problem. So what are some ideas for fixing this or for improving it? Well, one is fall back to imperative style where necessary. If you have some code that does some fairly complex data structure manipulation and it does it frequently, then you might want to use for loops and mutable variables for that. Um, just try to isolate it and make it referentially transparent so that other code can treat it as a pure function regardless. Um, avoid doing expensive computations in your UI components, because after all, the render method of your UI components is getting called very frequently. So one way you can avoid that expensive computation is to cache redundant values in your state. So let's say you've got um, like three levels down in your state, you've got a list, and in that list you've got more models, and each of those models has a main property. And let's say in your UI, you are going to have a list of all those names. It can be perf it can be better for performance if you create another property on your state model at the top level that's just that list of names. So now you've got those names stored in two places, which is redundant. You have to make sure that's kept in sync, but accessing them is faster. Um, and again, at least that keeping that in sync is constrained to your actions, since that's the only place anything ever gets changed. Um, finally, so React has, um, not when you do pure functional components, but when you do the create class style, there's a method called should component update that you can specify, and that basically says, um, it tells React some logic that it can use to determine whether it should skip the render method on that component, because it'll come out the same. Um, and so the simplest case for this, especially if you're using immutable data structures, is just if the props are what they used to be, if the values being passed in are what they used to be, then assume the output is also going to be what it used to be and skip kiss, skip checking. Um, that can definitely be beneficial for performance, but you do have to use it somewhat carefully because sometimes just checking the equality of those props can be more expensive than computing the re-render, especially if you're like, if you're comparing two immutable objects and you're comparing them not by reference equality but by deep comparison, then that can be more expensive than actually doing the render. Optimization is just when you're working with React, right? Because I thought React also is optimizing and actually changing the DOM. That's after this. This is so there's computing the VDOM and then there's applying the VDOM. Okay. So this, this is computing the VDOM. This is before, yeah. Yeah. So you're just saying that even that that computation can be expensive. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, some suggestions for debugging. So Kefir has a log function that the streams and properties have. So you just stick that into your chain of Kefir calls and it doesn't change what's in the stream, but it just outputs everything that goes through it to the console. Um, if you're logging immutable JS objects, if you just print out the object itself, it'll come out as garbage because it, it shows its internal structure, which is not what it represents because it's the tree inside. So you use two JS to turn them into POJOs. And then finally, um, if you're doing the, the immutable programming style with const everything, basically almost all your functions will boil down to a series of local variable declarations and then a return statement. And if you just put a debugging, if you just um, put a breakpoint on the return statement, 
then you can inspect all the local variables and you know that what they are at that point is what is the only thing they ever were. You know they weren't mutated after the fact at some point. So it makes it pretty easy to, to work backwards and figure out where something went wrong. Um, so for code safety, um, the unidirectional pipeline and immutability makes tracking bugs pretty easy. You pretty much just work backwards. Okay, my UI is wrong. Was the state wrong? If it was, then what action did this? Where did that action come from? And so on. Um, it's pretty linear. You don't have to figure out like which of several components updated this. Why are these two things out of sync? So on. Um, model changes only happen in actions. And the stream of actions can be inspected using that kefir.log. So you can see what's changing your model pretty easily. Um, the purity, the pure input-output style of most of the components can lead to good functional testing, or I mean unit testing. So, I mean, most of the things are receive certain input, output certain output. So that's pretty easy to unit test. Um, some next steps that I would take if I was next time I'm able to work on a fresh app with this stuff is switching to a different language. Um, the most obvious choice would be TypeScript, which is basically JavaScript plus static typing. Um, I'm a fan of static typing. I think it also leads to better code safety. And so combined with this stuff, it can really lead to some co solid code. Um, if I was on a particularly adventurous project, I might try Elm or PureScript, which are both um, Haskell-like languages that are, are pure programming, pure, pure, purely functional programming languages. So, um, you know, in, in this code, I've said these functions don't have side effects, but there's nothing in the compiler or the language runtime that prevent me from sticking side effects in there. In Elm and PureScript, there is. Um, most functions literally cannot do anything besides take their output, th their inputs, and compute an output. Um, so you get even more code safety that way. So unanswered design questions. So um, in larger apps, the state can get pretty big and pretty complicated. Um, you might have multiple actions that need to touch any given state field, so it can start to get harder to keep track of where changes are coming from, but arguably still not as hard as it would be in some other patterns. Um, the deeply nested state <laughs> objects can hurt performance, as I mentioned before, so you might have to start hoisting stuff up to the top level, which then makes the top level very crowded. Um, and then finally, how much state is really all the state? Um, it, depending on the requirements that you end up with on your project, you might need to start managing stuff that we normally take completely for granted, like scroll bar positions and which element is focused. And finally, certain built-in objects, most notably file inputs, are designed in a way that really does not work well in functional programming. Um, if you create a file input and then the user selects a file, there's no way for you to cr programmatically create another identical file input that already has that file selected. So the only thing you can do is hack around React's lifecycle to make sure that it doesn't actually recreate that DOM node, that it uses the same one. Um, <coughs> so that's super annoying. And there's no reason it has to be that way either. I don't know why they won't fix that stupid thing. Um, another potential issue is encapsulation. <laughs> so defining the UI and the state separately is really nice separation of concerns, but it means that if you wanted to use a third-party component, how's that going to look? I mean, right in most other patterns, a third-party component manages its own state, and it's just like a, a single self-contained thing. In this pattern, what's it going to do? Is it going to provide you with the component and its pieces of state and its actions to operate on those pieces of state separately, and you need to wire them into all the different parts of your app? Conceivably, but that's a little bit more boilerplate than would be ideal. So that's an unanswered question right now, is how to make that really work well. Um, here's a possible partial solution to some of these problems. Basically, compromise by, instead of having one huge state for your entire app, break it up at certain large levels. So instead of having one huge state for a gajillion small and overlapping states, maybe have like five. Um, this actually works perfectly with WBF widgets, because each widget can be its own instance of this pattern. And then you would have the separate parts <laughs> communicate with message passing to ensure that they're not referencing each other in inappropriate ways. All right, so to conclude, um, this is, a, I think, a powerful organization pattern that helps with separation of concerns, safety, and testability. Um, in my opinion, the frameworks it's based on are quite simple and easy to learn. Um, but it is a pretty new pattern, and so as I just mentioned, there's a few kinks to work out. <laughs>
Here are the docs pages for the three libraries that I rely on. And here's a few related projects. Um, Elm is another language. Ohm is this pattern in Clojure script. And Cycle.js is another framework for JavaScript that does this but is weird in at least one way that I've noticed. Uh, any final questions? Uh, I have one uh, quick one. Uh, so would you suggest uh, trying to implement some of these practices in an existing project or is this something that you really should uh, only start with if you have a, if you're starting a new project? So I will say that functional like hardline functional programming patterns like this don't usually play well with OOP patterns. So it definitely is best to start in a separate app if you were to try to do it in an existing app. I would do it from the bottom up. I definitely would not have code like this that calls into OOP code, but you could have OOP code that calls into this kind of code. Okay, great. Thank you. What does this look like on the bug? So, as I mentioned, there's the, the log functions that help a lot with that, and just setting breakpoints in your actions and your render functions. So, I mean, does, this, uh, does the call stack look crazy? It yeah, it's pretty noise? useless. <laughs> the call stack does not help at all. I, I can imagine that it's just going to be huge. Yeah, it's like 40 lines of kefir and then like one thing of yours. And, <laughs> and well, and React makes that hard too, because Re React makes no guarantees about when it calls your code. So. <laughs> Like, I'm, I'm not even sure it does it synchronously. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, if you're in your render function, then it'll be like a million lines of React and then your your render <laughs> function, and, like, that'll be the only thing appears in the whole stack. So it's, yeah, call stack-wise, debugging on this is not strong at all. Have you had any issues where, uh, because the, this is, there's asynchronous things going on and there's multiple streams that you, it's hard to correlate what actually was happening, or is, is that not really a concern? Like the sequence of things going on from the start of something happening to whatever it is you're trying to figure out. So, I mean, it all ultimately gets combined into the one action stream. Um, so you know there's always a specific order of actions being applied. Like nothing's ever truly happening at the same time or whatever. So, and you again, you can you can log that and you can see what order things happened in. And so no, I, I don't really think I've had that issue so much. So if you, in particular, found an action in your I guess a output of a log link that you think is the cause of some problem, can you find out where that was linked to? Like it was the action was. Like why 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 that action was there? Yeah, why it was there? Like. Um, for example, you could find out that that was when somebody clicked a button or when somebody gave it some action, some new action. Yeah, I mean, I think I haven't had to track that down in any ways that it was particularly mysterious. In most of my apps, there's only been one or two ways that a given action usually gets fired. Um, but I can imagine that could potentially get hard if you have one action that gets fired a lot of different ways. So would you say then when you're in the projects you use this on, the actions are pretty, they're pretty well defined, like there's a click this publish button action, and you know that because that's the action you, that you saw that showed up in your stream, but that's, you actually know where that came from or what it was bound to. More or less, yeah. Um, and I mean, well, so one thing you can do is if you know that a given action showed up in your stream, then you can put a breakpoint inside that action's action constructor. And that gets called by usually a UI event handler. So then you then in that case the call stack is actually helpful. It's one level up on the call stack is where it came from the UI basically. Or from uh, async action if that's where it came from. Do you know how to chain I wonder what this pattern looks like when you chain multiple asynchronous things together? It's great for that actually. Because um I mean you get your stream of Ajax responses and then you can flat map in more Ajax, more Ajax after that if you want, and it still is just a stream coming out. Anything else? Cool. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Yep.